Welcome to the interview. We're coming to you live from the 700 Club Studios in Virginia Beach in the USA. Just so you know, some of the shows that you can see on Revelation TV from the 700 Club are the 700 Club, the 700 Club Interactive, Christian World News, and Steckelbeck on Terror. And it's a privilege to have been invited by the CBN company to interview some of their key people. And later on today's program, I will be interviewing Dr. Pat Robinson himself, the founder of CBN and the main anchor of the 700 Club. But first, I'd like to introduce you to two members of the news team, George Thomas and John Wagi. Two of the top reporters for CBN News, George Thomas is CBN News Senior International Correspondent and co-anchor. John Wagi is a senior reporter and a political analyst. Now, John has been with CBN for 30 years. He has correctly predicted every presidential election since 1980. So you want to stay tuned and get some, an some answers to your questions. George has reported from over 85 countries. Now, scary situations and things like that we'll be getting into with you, George. But, you know, just it would be amiss of me to not share with our viewers some of the tragic and challenges that have, uh, you know, sort of wrapped people's lives in, and put them in a bit of a mess, really, on the East Coast just because of the hurricane that we've seen. And last night alone was just uh, devastating to the East Coast. One of the worst uh, Category 1 uh, storms has hit the East Coast, and yet we want to be uh, praying for people, and we can do that on this show because we're live as well. But just have a look at this news clip, just to remind the viewers at home in the UK and Europe, you know, just the sort of things that have been happening over the last 24 hours. After running parallel to the East Coast for days, Sandy made landfall Monday night, delivering a direct hit to the New Jersey coast. The 80 mile per hour winds and massive flooding left entire areas along the coastline underwater. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie advised those stranded in their homes to stay put. Evacuation is no longer possible and we're no longer able to come and rescue people. New York City was hit by a 13-foot storm surge, turning the city's streets into rivers. The worst of the weather uh, has uh, come, and the city certainly is feeling the impacts. At the Battery, we have seen record surge levels. We're seeing an extraordinary amount of water throughout lower Manhattan. There are trees down throughout the city. Among the areas underwater, the financial district. Today, the stock market will remain closed for a second day in a row, something that hasn't happened due to the weather since 1888. In the height of the storm, a New York City hospital had to evacuate more than 200 patients after its backup generator failed. In Queens, a fire destroyed at least 50 homes in the Breezy Point neighborhood. Firefighters had difficulty entering the area due to flooding. Many fire hydrants were completely underwater. Nearly 200 firefighters battled the six alarm blaze. Further south, a U.S. Coast Guard team rescued 14 crew members from a sailing ship that sank off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Sandy caused snowstorms in the mountains of Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Some areas even experiencing blizzard warnings. Today, Sandy's work is far from done. The storm is slowly working its way across Pennsylvania and upstate New York. Effects feared as far west as Wisconsin and Illinois. CBN's Operation Blessing has been watching the storm and making preparations to bring help to those who need it most. We, like everyone else in America, is you know, watching the Weather Channel, watching the TV, uh, waiting to see just what this storm is going to do. And whatever it does, we'll be responding to it. No doubt we'll be on the scene within 24 hours or wherever it does come ashore or wherever Operation Blessing is needed most. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. It's one of the things that we can do, isn't it, is pray. And especially when you, you've got live TV. And I thank God that Revelation TV and CBN and, uh, you know, partners that support these uh, channels actually can make a difference. You know, we've got uh, the programs like, you know, Operation Blessing. But... You know, would you like to just say a prayer and just be able to involve our viewers at home so that they too can join in? Sure, righteous. Pastor John, would you? Sure. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Lord, we thank you that even though the storm was a bad one, that it went through uh, the populated areas rather quickly. Yeah. We uh, understand that maybe 30 people lost their lives and the death toll could go higher. We thank you that more were spared. Yeah. Uh, Lord, we know that many people are trying to recover from uh, the loss of their homes or uh, severe flooding. 
uh, the closing of businesses, the closing of schools. And uh, Lord, we just thank you that uh, you will be there uh, and that uh, there is a spirit of cooperation and a spirit of uh, helping one's fellow man, Lord. And we uh, just pray that uh, by the power of Jesus that you would be there to minister Lord, to uh, the people who have, who have lost and those are even, who are even uh, fearful that more may come, more storm may come uh, as, the, as it moves west and north. And uh, Lord, we thank you again for your goodness. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, John. Now, you've been in some scary situations. Can you imagine, you know, does it compare to anything like... Uh, Hurricane Sandy? Well, weather, you know, weather, uh, Howard, is, is always a, a tricky situation. I have, over the years at CBN, I've covered um, uh, the tsunami in Asia. I was in Haiti a few hours after that massive earthquake. Mm -hmm. Covered the earthquake in uh, Concepcion, Chile, uh, Taiwan, Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, you know, natural catastrophes are, are just a horrible uh, event to cover. Uh, different ones have, you know, whether you're dealing with an earthquake or a, or a tsunami, but this clearly, as you mentioned, very clearly that this was, this, you know, the meteorologists were all spot on. They were telling people, look, this is serious. You have to take us seriously. And, I, you know, you have to applaud the governors and the local leaders in these various community states that really stepped up to the plate and said, folks, I mean, I'm thinking of Governor Christie, mm -hmm. you know, he's just, he's, he's a straight shooter. But he told the folks, listen, folks, you need to get out. Get out of these low-lying areas and, and be able to. But, you know, um, covering earthquakes, covering tsunamis, the, 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 the hopeful part is to see various organizations step up to the plate. And more importantly, when the government in these areas are underwater or are in, in also suffering, the church steps in, whether it's Operation Blessing or in various countries, local communities. And you know for a fact, whether it's in New York, New Jersey, um, in Pennsylvania, church communities are rallying, are stepping up to the plate. And, and that's the, the hopeful part, that in the midst of such devastation, mm -hmm. that the body of Christ rises to the occasion always. And we see it around the world covering various uh, disasters. Now, John, you're involved in the, the election campaign in the way of covering the news on that. Do you think yes. this is going to affect uh, the outcome of the uh, presidential election? I don't know if it will affect the outcome. What seems to have happened so far, Howard, is uh, there seems to have been kind of a freeze on the, the political campaign, which I think is a good thing. It would be pretty untoward if, if uh, candidates were out <clears throat> with their negative advertisements and, and really pounding away uh, at trying to gain uh, votes during this time. Uh, it could it could change the election, but I think in the next day uh, to two days, we're probably going to see a resumption of the campaign stepping back up to full force. And there'll be a good five days before the voters actually go to the polls, although many have voted in early voting already. But Tuesday is election day, and I think that we'll see it ramp up rather quickly now. I know the stock market is, is opening after two days of closure, which is almost unheard of yeah. for, the, for the Wall Street Stock Exchange. It will be open, and, and I think uh, the, the, the pu public culture element of all of this will get resuming to almost normal fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, normally you deal uh, with the, the Israel uh, aspect of um, the news as well, and that what is said about Israel in the media is, is, is an always quite negative. How do you deal with that? Well, it, it is, although we have uh, a news department here where we have kind of a different uh, editorial um, kind of direction of things. And actually, I think in the United States, the coverage of Israel is probably different than it is uh, in the UK and in Europe and some other areas of the world. It tends to be uh, there's more of a focus on the positives. I know that in the first presidential debate between Mitt Romney and President Obama that I think they brought up uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's name eight times in the debate. That was far more than any other world leader. Um, and I, th I think that that will, um, you know, that, that that's one element that is, is probably different from coverage in, in other parts of the world. But Israel is certainly uh, taking a center stage in foreign policy debates, although uh, the action in Libya also is having a great uh, impact now, but for most Americans, as far as uh, political coverage is concerned, uh, the economy uh, mm -hmm. triumphs over everything else. Mm -hmm. So, you mentioned uh, really uh, about uh, the 
some of the countries that are in the news with the Arab Spring, mm. uh, Libya. But, you know, w what's your take, George, on uh, what is really happening behind the scenes? Because, you know, there's a lot of oppression uh, against the Christians now in, through the uh, advent of the Arab Spring. Yeah. But is there a revival going on? I, I, what's happening with, the, uh, with, the, with that? You know, I think one of the, the, the beautiful things about working at CBN News is the opportunity to give our viewers, not just here in the United States, but, to, but around the world, a different perspective. And so when they watch our show, they will see a, a different analysis, a different take on the events that are playing out and in the Middle East. And I can tell you, if you were to go back, Howard, in our archives to two years ago, January 22nd, and we saw the events playing out on uh, downtown Cairo in the heart of Tahrir Square, mm -hmm. where the revolution took place, you would have heard it from myself, from John Wagi, from Eric Stackelbeck in Washington, D.C., from Chris Mitchell, our bureau chief uh, covering based out of Jerusalem. We were all saying, listen, we have to be very careful because in the in the vacuum of a dictator that, one, that uh, Hosni Mubarak was, he clearly was, he suppressed freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, women's rights were out of the door, the Coptics were suffering under the Mubarak regime. The reality is that he was a solid dictator and we backed him for the reason that we wanted stability. But in the process of a revolution, in the vacuum, the power vacuum where this one single man holds the pillar of the society with an iron fist. The moment you sever each one of those pillars, who fills the, the vacuum? And so we were saying on CBN News from the very get-go, listen, these are unprecedented moments that are, that, that's unraveling before our television screens. And we have to be very careful because who fills in the void? We need to, be, we need to ask that mm -hmm. question. And we have been saying, and John will back me up on this, we were saying from the very beginning that the Muslim Brotherhood has the potential of coming and taking that power, filling that power vacuum. And what do you know, two years later, the Muslim Brotherhood, the president of Egypt, Egypt is a Muslim Brotherhood. The parliament is filled with the Muslim Brotherhood. The other the, a portion of the parliament is filled by the, um, the so-called Salafis. Uh, and so clearly what we have called in the media the so-called Arab Spring is clearly turning into an Islamist winter. Just today, mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, uh, a leading Salafist leader told the Egyptians, any Egyptian who votes for the upcoming constitution that says that Sharia law, this very strict Islamic system of jurisprudence, that if this law is not the article, the premise of the Egyptian constitution, you will burn in hell. Mm. Well, and that's the challenge that we're facing today in Egypt and pretty much across the Middle East. Yeah, and, and with, with that, so there is a clip that we'll go to shortly because uh, yeah, there is a rise in Islamic fundamentalism in Europe to you know, a worrying degree. Uh, but John, just our viewers are not really au fait with the American political system. It's a little bit confusing. You know, it's not one man, one vote. So could you just give us an, uh, an overview of how that works and how it will work, play out in uh, the future? Well, uh, the, the election will be held, uh, like I said earlier, will be held Tuesday, but early voting began as, as long ago as 30 days ago. The winner of the popular vote in the United States is not necessarily the winner of the election. Each state's votes, uh, the, each state has a certain number of electoral votes, and whoever's going to be president needs 270 electoral votes to be named president of the United States. For instance, California, I think, has 55 electoral votes. The state of New Hampshire has only four. So the states vary, and, and, and the contest is coming down to maybe 10 key swing states, uh, states in the upper Midwest like Ohio and Wisconsin, states like Florida and Virginia. And in these states, uh, the electoral votes are, are critical. And so both candidates are trying to figure out where they spend their time and money to, to add up to 270 electoral votes by Tuesday night. Mm. So. Now, Mitt Romney, uh, a Mormon, uh, is that uh, a problem for the Americans? Uh, when you're talking, you know, the, the Christian faith and what Mormonism is, yeah. uh, or Barack Obama? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, it, with the advent of various social media like, like Twitter and Facebook, I posed this very question on my Facebook uh, um, uh, account, and, and it, was, uh, it, just, it just took off. Both sides, people who were saying, listen, Christians who said there's, there's just no way that I could vote for a Mormon because a Mormon is a cult. 
uh, and um, and uh, but then then there are, there are others who are saying, listen, I'm not I'm not voting for a pastor. <laughs> I'm voting I'm I'm voting pocketbook issues. I'm I, I'm looking for a man who can turn around this economy. And we are in a bona fide mess economically. Who who is qualified to make that judgment to put in the policies that can turn the ship that seems to be heading in the wrong direction, Absolutely, potentially yeah. sinking? Yeah. Who is the most qualified man to do that? So it is an issue in some you know in some sections some um, uh, communities in our, in our country but uh, I think at the end of the day I think John can answer this uh, well, um, yeah, um, I was even say better that, that it's it comes well, down I think to economy as well right well, predicted well, all the, the right what, what George says is absolutely right but but also in addition to that um, there is a there is a concern among many uh, Christians many people who uh, believe the Bible that the society is headed in the wrong direction with uh, with homosexual marriage uh, laws, with, uh, with the government mandating that uh, employers provide employees with contraception. That, that flies in the face of the teaching of the Catholic Church, for instance. And so there's, there's some real religious liberty themes at work here. And Mitt Romney, uh, despite uh, what his faith is, represents uh, a more pro-religious liberty kind of uh, stands here and and there are some real concerns about the pre president obama and wh the direction he's been taking it so that is a factor as well as the economy in all of this um, and and will be a factor in some of these close races that we mm. see now i'd like to show a clip uh, that where eric stuckelbeck uh, did put the whole program out on the the rise of islam uh, and also with regards to Shia, Sharia law becoming established in the UK, even uh, looking to it to happen in the U uh, USA and obviously all over Europe. So uh, if we could look at that clip, I know we might be going out of sequence here a bit, but it's important uh, for us to have a look and we'll come back and talk about this. Anjum Chowdhury has been called the face of radical Islam in Great Britain. He holds frequent rallies calling for Islamic Sharia law to be imposed on that country. CBN News first interviewed him in 2010, right after the British government banned his group Sharia for UK. On a recent visit to London, we found the ban has failed to stop Chowdhury from spreading his message that Islam will soon dominate Britain and the world. So you believe America, Great Britain, all of Europe will be Islamic states living under Sharia eventually? Inevitably. I'm convinced, I'm 100% you know, certain that the Sharia will be implemented in America and, America and in Britain one day. The question is when and how it will come to fruition. And he's unapologetic about what a society ruled by Sharia would mean. If people are afraid of having their hands cut, don't steal. If you don't want to be uh, stoned to death, don't commit adultery. I mean, it seems to me that people want all of the vices and they want to get away with it as well. But, uh, you know, it doesn't work like that. Chowdhury's vision is catching on among some Western Muslims. Sharia for UK has spawned at least two offshoots, Sharia for Holland and Sharia for Belgium. There's also Sharia for America, based in New York City, which Chowdhury says is active on U.S. soil. Tell us more about Sharia for America and what they're all about. We had the Sharia for America project where we put down what we consider to be a, an alternative to liberal democracy and freedom and the kind of life that people lead in America. Sharia for America is not alone. Its pro-Sharia, pro-Caliphate message has been echoed in recent years by a Chicago area group called Hizbut Tahrir America. Ultimately, the Americans will be defeated. They're going to be defeated back home, and they will be defeated militarily, and they will not get the resources. They will go from uh, the depression, you know, and the recession into, uh, you know, a complete, uh, if you like, uh, you know, downfall. Chowdhury's public support for jihad against British troops keeps his group on the radar of the country's intelligence services. Some of his followers have been arrested on terrorism charges, but Chowdhury claims his group rejects violence for now. Britain is Darul Haram because they are, you know, anathema to, uh, to God's law. They're not implementing it, they're violating his sanctity, and therefore this is, uh, this is war against Allah and his messenger. But uh, we are not allowed to actually fight them here at the current time, so we are, you know, propagating at Islam. At the current time. At the current time, you know, if, they, Will there if be there's a time? time. Well, you know, Eric, you know, we are not like the Christians. You know, if you hit me on the left cheek, I'm not going to give you my right cheek. I'm going to defend myself. So at the moment, we're propagating Islam peacefully. But if they attack us, we have a right to defend ourselves. What if they don't attack, but say you get numbers, you get strength, mm -hmm. say Muslims became a majority in Great Britain, yeah. then would there be a cause for offensive if jihad? We have, if we have enough authority, 
and we have enough power, we are obliged as Muslims to take the authority away from the people who have it and implement the Sharia. In the meantime, he's encouraged by the Islamist regimes coming to power as a result of the so-called Arab Spring and takes it as a sign that his goal of a global caliphate is inevitable. Eric Stackelbeck, CBN News, London. Okay, that clip was from Stuckelbeck on terror, and it was uh, shown quite recently on Revelation TV. A bit scary, is it? It's not a matter if it's going to happen, when it's going to happen. Yeah, and, and what's unfortunate in, in places like Great Britain and other parts of Europe is, is a parallel society where Muslims are literally living a completely different lifestyle. They have uh, shops where they, they're, they're only halal, where you only get halal meats. You have schools, madrasas, that where only the, the Muslim children go to. And so multiculturalism in Europe has, in essence, created this parallel society. And the, the, the majority society is doing absolutely nothing to encourage Muslims, listen, you need to integrate, you need to be part of our society and part of the greater uh, aspirations of, of democracy in, in, our, in our country. John, just a quick comment from you. Well, I think that uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, Americans believe, I don't know if it's as prevalent in the UK because there is a larger Muslim population uh, related to the total population, but in America, a lot of people tend to think of the people shouting in Arabic like Osama bin Laden or something like that as some distant non-threat. They may even be a joke like Ahmadinejad is. But here's a man who's well-spoken, who's saying some truly chilling things. And uh, it, it, it's, they mean it. And I don't think enough uh, people in the United States and, uh, and Christians, for that matter, uh, take it seriously. Exactly what I would have said. Thank you very much to both of you, You're George welcome. and John, for being with us on Revelation TV's interview Thank program. You. Now, we're going to go to a clip. Uh, it's a promo clip for CBN, but I want you to know that Pat Robertson will be joining me straight after that. Y todo era bueno. Él nos ha creado para conocer. Lan bangun kesang sesarengan minongko keluarga. Obwohl er jede Nation, jeden Volksstamm und jeden Menschen liebte, nós desprezamos o seu amor. Nosso pecado nos separou dele. Mais lui ne nous a pas abandonné. Jésus Christ a laissé le ciel pour venir auprès de nous. Его пригвоздили к Кресту, и Он умер за наши грехи. Tapi mantana, bangkit tina kubur, hirup dientan ia. Si Yesus ay babalik muli, pinananabikan natin ang araw ng kanyang pagbabalik. But until then, we will share God's love in English. Auf Deutsch. Portugues. Puso Javi. So every person might come to know our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Ito ang ating misyon. Ia hasrat orang. В этом наше будущее. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Welcome back to the program. I just want to remind you, this is live coming from Virginia Beach, 700 Club Studios. You might look familiar. Now, Dr. Pat Robertson is the founder of CBN, who has just celebrated 50 years of broadcasting. And today, CBN is one of the world's largest television ministries and produces programming seen in over 200 nations and heard in 70 different languages. Now, Dr. Pat, welcome. 
Hey, thank you. Seems strange for me to say welcome to you well, in your I'm, own I'm sense. delighted to be welcome to this wonderful uh, program on the UK. Yeah. It's great. Well, our viewers will really appreciate this because it is live. It's scary sometimes, but, you know, live is best, I think. Much better, much better. You know, because we can interact with people's needs, their prayer needs, their, sure. and, and speak by the Spirit of God that's in us directly into a situation that could be happening as it was yes. indeed this terrible hurricane mm -hmm. disaster. Now, if, we, if programs were pre-recorded, as they often used to be in the old days, mm -hmm. um, it, it's irrelevant to well, some degree. When we first started out, we didn't, have, we didn't have video recorders, so everything had to be live, whether we liked it or not. That meant all the mistakes went out over the air. Well, you know, I, I read the transcript of the interview you did with uh, George Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was four o'clock this morning because I'm on British time yeah. still. Yeah. And I was absolutely amazed at the similarity between what happened with yourself and, mm -hmm. and ourselves because God put on my heart that we had to be live. And uh, there was a, this was back in 2003, mm -hmm. and this was the time of just the uh, beginning of the war and Saddam, um, not Saddam, uh, yeah, it was Saddam, Saddam yeah, was it was, that's right. And, and the thing is, he'd put money into a channel that we were supposed to be using the studios of, and, and the, the last minute, because he was paying big bucks for this, mm. uh, it was the beginning of February 2003, uh, that we got sidelined. And I had to turn a little office into a live room. I said, God said it's going to be live, and it's going to be live. And same as yourself, you well, know. Well, that is wonderful. Yeah. Well, I congratulate you on what you're doing, and I, I just hope it's very successful. Now, Pat, there's so many things that you've helped people through your ministry, and in particular our Revelation TV viewers, so they're going to be thrilled to be able to hear from you tonight. Words of wisdom, anything that you want to share, feel free, you know, because this is an exciting time to live in, is it not? A few years ago, you know, I spend time at the end of each year praying and, and uh, asking God to give me words, what He would like me to do to some direction. And uh, I think it was, uh, I guess it was 94, 95. Um, I was praying and God said, I'm going to send my spirit over the whole world. And He said, people on every continent are going to be touched by the Holy Spirit, everyone. And he said, your job is to take the gospel to them. Said, Don't bother about teaching them theology. Don't go into complex doctrine. Just tell them about Jesus, and they'll believe. And uh, we set as a goal to see 500 million people come to the Lord. And it just seems staggering, but I, you know, I figure for God, it's just as easy to save one as to save a million as to save 500 million. It's all, I mean, it's easy for God. and. Over the years, we have seen that goal fulfilled because the Spirit of God is moving around the world. So what I'd like to encourage you to do is that this is going to be a great revival in the UK. Great revival. Tremendous heritage. You know, I'm, yes. I uh, used to cut my teeth reading about John Wesley, great man of God. You see the, the great pioneers of the faith that have come out of the, out of the, the British Isles. I mean, tremendous. You know, I was just reading a few hours ago about some of George Muller's oh, yes. uh, Mueller, great, uh, uh, great man uh, who believed God. Mm -hmm. So you have a great heritage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that was one of the books. I'm dyslexic, so I've read very few books in my life. In uh -huh. fact, the very first book I read was the Bible, and I was only 20. I was only 21. I was 21. I yeah. couldn't read properly, be, being dyslexic. Right. But I had to read three books for when I uh, was joined Mercy Ships uh, mm -hmm. to the DTS with them, and I had to, it was compulsory to do three books in one month, and George Muller was one of them, and it changed my life, understanding really the power of prayer, and, yes. but also trusting in God. Now, you're a man that's had to be trusting in God for everything mm -hmm. that's been achieved. Now, on that interview you did with George, mm -hmm. uh, there was a saying, what, how would you like to be remembered? Now, you said that really it was more or less about being obedient, really, yes. to God. And that is so key, because many of us can miss that moment when God says, would you do this? And you, you pass him by, you say no. Mm -hmm. But what, what would you say to people today to encourage well, them? I tell you, the will of God, you know, the Bible says it's the perfect will of God. Uh, it isn't something scary. 
the, the Lord is blessing. It is a path of blessing. And you look around this place. When we came to this center where you are now, there are all kinds of structures as a university and all these things. There wasn't anything here. It's just but, acreage. Yeah, but God said, I want you to buy that land. And then he said, With Bill, what? Bill, I didn't have any money. <laughs> he had afraid. no money. Yeah. So I went to the bank. I said, I'm going to buy this land. And they said, well, how are you going to pay for it? I said, nothing down. I didn't have any money. I mean, so, you know, but everything. The Lord God's said, favor. yeah, build that, build that, do that, do the other. And as long as he's in it, there's no end to his power, no end. Your favorite scripture? Oh, I think Romans 8, 28. God, you know, the, the literal uh, translation is, God shapes every circumstance for good to them that love Him, you know. Uh, the, and he, every circumstance. So you, you, there's no such thing as a bad day for a Christian. When I was in seminary, they told us that the Christians are like goats. We can thrive on tin cans or on green grass. It doesn't matter. <laughs> whatever, whatever comes up. And so you, you maintain a spirit of praise and joy regardless of what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you're interested in politics, and you've come, you know, from a legal background, mm -hmm. uh, and you gave all that up to be obedient to the Lord's calling to start uh, what we have here today, known as CBN. You know, what was it that really sort of um, got you on that track and, and the took you? Thing? Yeah, yeah. Well. Why do you think it's important? Uh, well, first of all, you know, my father was a senator, and I, I laughingly say, uh, I first learned mama, then daddy, then constituent. Really? <laughs> because when I was two years old, he was always talking about what would the constituents think. He went to Congress when I was two. So he served all that time in the Senate, the United States Senate, and, and House of Representatives. And... Uh, so I grew up in that background, and when I, you go back in history, uh, several of my ancestors were uh, like presidents of the United States and things like that. Uh, but uh, what brought me into politics was Jimmy Carter. Here was a man who said he's a born-again Christian, and mm. I began to say, oh, that's great. So I, I began to watch, and I, I began I to see— I think we became disappointed, did we not? Terribly disappointed. And I, I began to see that he was being controlled by people out of New York. And, uh, you know, he wasn't his own man in charge of certain things. And then, of course, he made some terrible mistakes. But that got me interested. And then I was, uh, uh, well, I, I was going to say rabid, but I wasn't a rabid, but a very enthusiastic supporter of Ronald Reagan. And when he left, it just seemed like I believed so many of the things he believed. A strong national defense, limited government, lower taxation, freedom, and, and you know, the bulwark against communism, et cetera. And I thought I could, uh, you know, be an heir to him, and so I, I ran for president. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do too bad. I came in third. Wow, wow. I, but you see it as an important part of a Christian life, really, is, is looking at the political side uh, mm -hmm. and, and actually getting involved. Now, with the current situation, where, where do you stand with uh, Mitt Romney and uh, the re-election of Barack Obama? Well, uh, I, 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 I'm just appalled at some of the things that have been done uh, uh, by Obama. I think that uh, in foreign policy, he's, he's been a disaster. I think in domestic policy, our country is hurting. Uh, and uh, he, is, he is a... a, a they use the term progressive. I don't know what the, and one day they used to call them socialists, but the idea is he thinks the government is the answer. And I think the private free enterprise system is the answer. He wants to load more and more regulations. Uh, I want to free uh, individuals. Um, so, so not I, a nanny state. And not a nanny state, absolutely. Uh, and I, I think we need a safety net. We need to look after the poor. I started Operation Blessing. We have helped millions of people around the world that are hungry, people who need water, people uh, uh, who need medicine and all these things. We do that. But uh, I just think for an overarching welfare state where they control everything you do, that's dangerous. It's terrible. So in any event, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of Mitt Romney. He's a good friend, and he's going to be the next president, and I think he's going to do half a second term. So that's my, you want my prediction yes. here in advance of the election? That's what's going to happen. Right. Now, to some, we, we had this discussion a little bit earlier with uh, John and George, but mm -hmm. really some Christians out there would be a bit concerned because of Romney being a Mormon. How, how do you deal with that? Well, 
I know enough about Mormonism to realize that uh, it's not anything that I want to embrace. I, I think that there's uh, theological error substantially uh, in Mormonism. Uh, it tracks a great many uh, points with uh, Islam. If you, you know, there's a revelation in a cave, there's a revelation from an angel, there was, uh, you know, unlimited wives, there's unlimited wives, you know, that mm. all the way up and down the line. Uh, and both they came after the book of Revelation, where it says in the last chapter that nothing shall really be added to this book. Of course. Mm. But in any event, Romney is not running as chief theologian or chief pastor. He's running the chief executive. He is a tremendous executive. He is a very um, honest, honorable man. He's a family man. He, he stands for most of the values that I hold dear. And I think he's going to be a good president. He's not going to be nearly as as conservative as I think a lot of his supporters and conservatives would like to see. But I do think he's going to turn out to be a very fine president. But he is a CEO. He's going to run this country yes. like, a, like a businessman. Absolutely. And I think that's something that's missing. Uh, even in the UK, there's nobody <laughs> really in power that, that comes along that's got any history or any experience in the real world. And mm -hmm. they, therefore, they can't relate to the business people that really keep the economy is going. Well, you have to do that. Now, Mitt has started many businesses. One, some notable exceptions, I mean, not exceptions, but the examples like Staples. He's taken a small company and built it into a huge uh, behemoth, you know, uh, giving jobs to thousands of people. And uh, I, I, th I think he, I ask you, you know, he took over the, the Olympics, the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. They were in serious financial trouble. And uh, they, owed a, they owed $150 million. And I said to him, Mitt, how did you do it? <laughs> he said, I went to 150 people. I asked each one for a million dollars. <laughs> and that, but he's, he's that sort of practical. That, yeah. I mean, he went and he like said, here's the problem and here's the solution and I'm going to fix it. And that, that's, mm. he will approach government. Here's how much we're spending on defense. That should be 12%, 15%, 20%, whatever. Uh, the government is taking 24% uh, of the GDP. It should be 18%. So he's going to start cutting it down. And, and acting like a businessman. Do you think Romney's got enough experience, really, with, to deal with the, the Middle East uh, situation? Well, he had a whole lot more. Uh, Obama had no experience doing anything. He was a community organizer in Chicago. He had been a, a, a state senator for one and a half terms. On a, then he was a senator for half a term, I think. And then they say, you know, he's president. He doesn't know anything about anything. And it shows. He, he, he's clueless. That's why he likes to campaign. He loves to campaign. He loves to speak. He loves to hear his own voice. So Romney uh, probably more beneficial to Israel than Iraq is? Oh, there's no question. No question. No, he's a staunch supporter of Israel, as I am. I am a, uh, and I, I'm not sure, you know, Europe has turned against Israel. I, I, we did a lot of work in the uh, East Bloc countries right after the fall of communism, and I could not believe uh, the um, uh, overt anti-Semitism in Romania and Hungary and places like that. I mean, there may have been three, four thousand Jews in, in, in Romania, and yet they were virulently anti-Semitic. And he just said, what in the world? Where does this come from? Mm. I'm sure our viewers, and myself included, would love to know really where and how and at what stage in your life did Israel become, in, uh, whether, was there a revelation about Israel? Like a lot of people, I had a praying mother. Maybe, did you have a praying mother? No, I didn't, did but I, <laughs> I had a godly praying mother who, who prayed me into the kingdom when I was sowing many wild oats out of the far distant fields. But she taught me the Bible that says, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. But I was a little boy, she taught me that. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like learned a love of Israel at my mother's knee. And then it just was part of me. And then later on, when I was in seminary, <clears throat> I had a, a class of Jewish uh, executive, young executives and business people in New York. And I was teaching them out of the Old Testament. And we had a wonderful time. And I developed a great love for the Jewish people. And then subsequently, I've been over there many, many times. We've had a TV station on the Middle East. And, uh, but that's where it, it came from. It's, it's rooted way back in my, in my DNA and in mm -hmm. my, my, my mother.
Do you know, I, had, uh, t I was reading the Bible on my own. Mm -hmm. I had nobody show me. I came across Romans 11, mm -hmm. and it said in that rendition, this is a sacred secret. And I, so I, I just went, you know how when you're reading, sometimes yes. you read it, and then you get into the habit, and you're just reading for the sake of reading. And I went, sacred secret, what's this? And I read it, and it was just like a light went on. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find anywhere that I could share this. And I ended up getting in my van, don't laugh, mm -hmm. and I drove to Israel. I had to go across you a few... You drove to Israel? I drove to Israel. From in a, Great Britain? In a little VW camper van. <laughs> I stayed on a kibbutz for three months. <laughs> yes. Kafar Bloom in the north. I just... I would just somehow, God opened my eyes and I just had such a love for the Jewish people. And I, I stayed on this kibbutz, I worked um, uh, in, as, just really as an ordinary person would, picking apples in the morning, mm -hmm. getting up at six o'clock, working and cleaning up the canteen and things like that. And, and I'd come from a quite a wealthy background at that stage, mm -hmm. it's a long story, but, uh, okay. but the thing was I just wanted to serve. And then I came back from there, this is going back to 1979, and I, I couldn't find anywhere that had a, a, the same could sh I could share with, not even in the church I was going to. And I think that's a problem in, to, in the Christian church today. There's such an ignorance about well, Israel and the importance. Into some of the, uh, the church fathers, and I was shocked, uh, uh, Luther was virulent against the Jews. I mean virulent, Martin Luther, you know, virulent. And uh, Calvin and some of his followers in the Reformed uh, movement uh, taught replacement theology that the church replaced Israel. It doesn't. The promises of God to Israel are to Israel. The promises of God to the church are to the church. But a replacement theology. Yeah, but the replacement is the Jews don't mean anything any longer. Mm -hmm. That modern day Israel. That's not true. And. Uh, uh, it's such a miracle that these people have come back after all those years of wandering and the, the diaspora, and suddenly they've come back and they've, they've got a, their own language. They're, they're speaking Hebrew. And, I mean, it's, it's a miracle of God. Absolutely. It, yeah. Such a tiny nation, small people group, and yet God has yeah. restored them. See, and it, it should be, uh, you know, a, an eye-opener for people to, to, this is prophetic. It's the fulfillment of God's well, Word. You remember when Queen Victoria, you, uh, you didn't remember, you weren't no, no, there. No. <laughs> you, yeah. you and I have read. Uh, she, her prime minister was uh, Disraeli, the Israel, you know, Disraeli, yes. and she said, "Mr. Prime Minister, can you give me an example, a proof of God?" And he thought for a minute, and he said, "The Jew, Your Majesty, you remember that? The Jew. That's the proof yeah. of God. It's the yeah. proof that God exists. The, the fact that they're still here after all these years and all these persecutions, they're still here." Yeah. Do you know? I'd love you to pray for our viewers as well, especially for those who don't have an understanding about Israel, because some people would even say, to go as far as to say, you can't really be born again Christian without having a revelation that God has a will and purpose for Israel and it still exists today, and he hasn't rejected his people. No, he hasn't. But uh, I, I wouldn't equate uh, pro-Israel with, with salvation, but nevertheless, I do think that there's something in our heart. Uh, we love God. We love our Lord, who happened to be Jewish, he's the Messiah, and we take our scriptures from the Jews. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all those people are all Jews. And uh, so if we love the Messiah, you almost have to love his people. So you want to pray? Yeah. All let's right. Let's join hands. Thank Father, mm. I pray for this wonderful channel. I pray for the audience. I thank you for my heritage that comes from the British Isles. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless and bless Israel as the nations of the earth have turned against her. Raise up a standard. Defend your people. And may there be one man coming together, the Jew, the Gentile, the Christian, that we might live together as you would intend, in the name of Jesus. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pat. Now, Pat, mm. 29 years of age? No. That's, no, I'm, only, I'm, I'm joking. It's a, a little bit of a joke here. But that's I, mean, I, I started. I, I, we, we got into the ministry when I was just turned 30. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, he, uh, you, over 80. 82. 82. Oh, 82. I'm wow. still going strong. How do you do it? 
daily broadcasts. Well, you know, Monday through Friday, anyway. You know, of course, God's given me the love of a wonderful woman. We've been married for almost 60 years, 58 years, and I've got four children, 14 grandchildren. But uh, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, I just, the Lord just gives me strength every day. Your strength is renewed like an eagle. That's what He sees, promises. And I, I, He said, we're supposed to live 120, and I'm, I'm counting down to 100, so I've got eight, 18 more to go. <laughs> that to get to 120. But I just feel strong. Uh, before this broadcast, a little while ago, I was lifting weights, you know, pushing iron. And uh, I exercise, I ride horses. And uh, I just think well, our minds and hearts need to be full of exciting things. And if we do, we'll stay young. Mm. You won't believe this, but I play soccer. I'm 66. I play soccer Dream. three or four times a week. I live in Spain, because that's where we broadcast from. We could talk about that in a minute. But you know, one of the things I believe that God has helped me to keep uh, awake and alert mm -hmm. is through being fit. Yes. And playing football with, uh, or soccer as we say, in, over here in America, uh, it, it ha actually helps you to, to focus and to stay fit. But you, you've got to feed the body the right foods. And sometimes, uh, as Christians, perhaps we, we don't well, take care of that body. I have just come out with, you know, I, uh, I've got a son who loves to cook, and he cooks things that aren't necessarily the most healthy in the world. <laughs> but I, I have a taste for the, what the Italians call minestrone. Uh, I mean, this is a, the, the soup, the vegetable oh, soup. I love that. So I decided I was going to make some minestrone, and and I didn't really follow any recipe. I told my wife, "Get me some of this, some of this. Get me some cabbage, and get me some this, and get me some celery, and get me some, and um, some chickpeas, etc." And I just dumped it on the big pot and turned it on and boiled it for about five hours. And out came this absolutely delicious soup. And everybody, we did it here. Everybody just loves it, but it's so healthy. Mm. I, I think low glycemic food is the way to go. The, the, uh, the thing that is killing us is, uh, is this inflammation, you know, that's caused by eating too, much, too many sweets, too much uh, processed flour. Processed foods generally. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it kills us. You look at you know, uh, I think uh, the United States has done the world a great disservice, you know, in introducing McDonald's and all these fried foods and things into the public life. Would you say <clears> that <throat> it contributes to cancer? Oh, there's no question about it. Absolutely. I mean, you can, you can go down the list, cancer and diabetes and uh, high blood pressure and heart attacks, strokes, all these things. And, and Parkinson's disease and, and um, the onset of dementia, all of it is caused, I would say 80, 90 percent of it is caused by the type of food we're putting into our bodies or the chemicals we breathe in the air. Mm. Something that I think uh, is, is challenging to all Christian media groups, mm -hmm. and that is uh, the, the fact that one day, and I don't know how soon, but maybe you could help us here to see this, uh, that we will be shut down because of governments, uh, you know, we don't, we're not politically PC, you know, politically correct. And we say things, we speak from the Word of God. How do you deal with this? For, for example, you, when you come across uh, the homosexual uh, mm. lifestyle, which is clearly spoken about in the Bible, and yet uh, it's becoming more and more acceptable in, in the world, uh, you know, how do we deal with that? How do we address that issue? in a loving way to talk to the people that are living this and thinking because the government's changed the law and made it acceptable mm -hmm. to them, but it's not acceptable to God. You know, Martin Luther said, you can be orthodox in all the things that you believe except in the one place where the devil's attacking. And if you fail there, you fail at all. And I think that's what we're looking at here. The one place the devil is attacking is Reproduction. Of course. Reproduction. The, the creation of life, which mm -hmm. is the most fundamental chance that we have uh, as human beings is to create a life in the image of God. And we're be, it's being attacked in abortion, and it's being attacked in homosexuality. Homosexuals don't, don't have babies. They, I mean, if, that's, if the two of them, I mean, two males, two females together, they're not going to create life. And so, it's a sterile situation, and, and the abortion, uh, a lot of women, you know, I think some of the feminists, the strong feminists, uh, are jealous of, the, of their sisters who are having babies. 
and they have a they have attacked uh, reproduction. You know, the idea is that we've got to have more and more abortions, and we've slaughtered 50 million people in the United States. 50 million babies mm -hmm. in America. So uh, that's where. And so, what do you do? Well, I don't major on these things because I love homosexuals. I really do, and I love people that have had abortions. I love. I just have a love in my heart for people, and I, I don't get on a soap up, a soapbox, and condemn folks and and that kind of thing. I think it's 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 a mistake. But I, I just say, here's the love of God, and I think the Holy Spirit will lead people into truth. I hope so. Mm. Other challenges for Christian media groups, probably talking about you know Jesus Christ as being the only way, mm. um, and uh, when you when you see the rise of Islam. Uh, particularly in the West, you know, do you see that as, uh, you know, <laughs> as, a, as a, something that Christians ought to? Re how can they deal with that? Because they, it, the they, population they, explosion alone amongst the Islamic got the, got the whole fast on that one. You've got to, you've got to stand up and, and say Jesus is the, he is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. That's what the Bible says, and I believe it. And I, I think He will honor that confession of faith. Uh, we at CBN have what I believe is the largest uh, Arabic-themed Christian series of programs in the world. Uh, on our uh, website, we have as many as 50 million hits from people in, into our Arab, uh, Arabic language. That's just that's just on the internet. And we have other programs. The Muslims are desperately hungry for love. There's no love in salvation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Muhammad himself could not tell you, I'm going to heaven. And you ask any Muslim, are you certain you're going to heaven? Not one of them can give you an answer. That's you right. know, I am, like the Apostle Paul, he said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed unto him against that day. I'm going to heaven, brother. You're going to heaven. You won't hear a Muslim say that. I will go to heaven if I die as a shaheed in a jihad against the infidel. Then I'll get 72 virgins and I'll be in paradise. But that's the only way to, to be sure. It's a big lie. What a horrible, horrible deception that is. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for love, especially the women. You know, to go, we going to be second class citizens? Can we have roles in society? Can we, in Saudi Arabia, can we drive cars? Can we own property? Can we be free? They want that and they want love. Love. <laughs> There's no love in the Quran. It's always hate. We have a lot of Muslim viewers, so you'd be, you know, but they, they, are, they are watching, as well as a lot of atheists. You know, and in fact, we have a uh, one particular atheist who just wrote to us recently and said, I'm starting to support you uh, because I enjoy watching the programs. And it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to have viewers on Revelation TV that can relate to what we're talking about, even if they disagree. L-O-V-E, love. God mm. is love. God loves you, but he at the same time is a righteous judge. And, and we, we can't get and what they used to call sloppy agape, you know, uh, like this love that lets you do anything you want to do. God isn't that way. He's, he's a consuming fire. But He is loving. He's love. And I think the homosexuals need to know that God loves them. The atheists need to know God loves them. The Muslims need to know God loves them. I mean, you know, God loves them. But they need to come to His love through His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you see we're closer to the fulfillment of the prophecy about Arab and Jew coming together um, through the Arabs, the advent of the Arab Spring? You know? No. Um, the time it'll come together, if you read Isaiah, uh, it has to do uh, with Assyria join Egypt, and the mm -hmm. two uh, will be, uh, will they be one with I Israel in, in the in the land, and the, the, those three nations <clears throat> will come together. Uh, I, I see, uh, uh, if I'm reading Ezekiel the prophet, 38th chapter, mm -hmm. I see a, uh, a coalition uh, led by Persia, Iran. Mm -hmm led by the, uh, the Sudan, led by Turkey, led by Russia, all joining together to come against Israel in the latter days. So I don't see any peace. Uh, and uh, I think this, um, this is an illusory peace 
uh, this uh, Arab Spring, it's just made the way for the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood, as you've probably heard earlier on this program, they want to establish a caliphate uh, like they used to be, uh, where they, they, they dominated the Fertile Crescent. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't see any harmony right now, but I do see many, many, many millions of Muslims accepting Jesus. How, how do you see that happening? Is it through perhaps a revelation or uh, through well, the Lord you know, appearing to them? The, the Lord is appearing. We did a, we did a series of programs uh, dramatizing instances in Egypt, uh, in Iraq, in Saudi Arabia, uh, in other countries in the Arab world where Jesus Christ is appearing to people. And uh, they, they, they want to find out about him. But it, it's, it's so moving what's happening. He's, so he's doing it. Uh, Christian television uh, is doing it. Um, and others who are spreading the gospel. It isn't easy operating in Muslim lands uh, on the field. I mean, you, you, the, the danger of being uh, assassinated is very strong. Mm -hmm. Now, we're in the closing couple of minutes, I think, here now. Right. Just the, the programs that you've been putting on this week, uh, and by the way, our viewers can watch you live, mm. uh, or not live, but pre-recorded. Um, mm. The 700 Club is going to follow this program in, on Revelation TV. Good. But the, the programs you're doing at the moment are all on, you know, sort of uh, near-death experiences or right. uh, life after death. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give our viewers who haven't got a hope for the future, uh, just give them some, some indication of well, why we've got something special. Jesus Christ said, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, but I am the resurrection. I am the life, and he that believes in me shall never die. And so we're showing examples of people who were physically dead and their spirits went to heaven or their spirits went to hell. So. Uh, Oh, we're having a tremendous response of people. People want to know what's going to happen next, what happens after this life. And the good news, my brother, and you know, and you're telling it on Revelation TV, is that we live beyond the grave. The grave is not the end. The question is, where are we going to go at the end? And if we're with Jesus, we're going to be with him forever in paradise. That's the Amen. good news. That new heaven and new earth, which we're all looking forward to. Where we are. Dr. Pat, I just want to thank you very much for... Well, thank you for what you're doing, and God bless you, and prosper you, and use you. Well, thank you. And, you know, we, we've got that special relationship uh, with yourselves, and uh, Revelation TV viewers really appreciate it, and we too as well. We're a small team, but we're, we're following you, and we're really, really happy that... Uh, to be invited here. Well, oh, we're your... delighted you're here, and I hope that we've shown you appropriate hospitality. And... You have indeed. So well, God bless you, sir. God bless you too, my brother. May Thank your you. life be. Thank you very much indeed to all our viewers who really supported the 700 Club as well. We thank you for that. Continue to do so. God bless you, and good night.